So I made a couple of quick marks on here. I actually don't like the marks I made um, because I don't like the placement. We're going to put a line right here, almost a little slightly above center. And then we're going to take at about this point and we're going to go up. I'm just going to go up. And then we're going to get the placement of some of this activity. And I can't even tell what some of it is. I think some of it is just trailers and boxes. And then behind that is this wonderful little uh, beat up. It's not terribly beat up, it's still useful, a uh, barn. So we're kind of just indicating some of these key elements. All right. Um, and the big tree that kind of comes up over it looks like there's about that much space. So we're just going to kind of take it. It looks like it goes that direction. So that's the stroke I make. I don't make, I don't make it more complicated than that. If I'm doing a studio painting, I might. But as a demonstration, plain air type of demonstration, no. So we're going to go up, go over the top of this. And there's kind of a tree shape. That's about all we need in there. Then there's a building off to the left. And the top of that building intersects right about here. So that's going to be the top of the building. It's going to be a little bit more ground plane here. It's about this wide. Real flat roof. Another little building off to the side here with a tree interrupting it. This building is even smaller. Okay, so we've got some of the stuff that we need in here. Now we need kind of this tree, it comes in. I'm trying to pick something today without a sky. Um, not that there isn't a sky, the sky's way the heck up here. But uh, actually there's a piece of it right there, but I'm not gonna put it in. I'm gonna do a fogged back mountain is what we're gonna do here. Foggy mountain. Is that a foggy mountain? Foggy mountain breakdown, yeah. I knew that was a, uh, that's a bluegrass number, man. Earl Flatten Scruggs. For all of you bluegrass fans out there, I know there's some of you are kind of, uh, I don't want to say you're a bluegrass fan. There's some little cows. Hopefully I can get some of these little guys in here. The reason, well, that's one of the reasons I picked this is I'd like to get a little, few of these little cows up front here. So it's just kind of a nice little touch. Uh, but let's see what we can do. So that's about all we're going to sketch in. All right. So with that in mind, we're going to always start with the background, work forward. Number 12, Rosemary. See how my handles, when the handles get like this, they get all, I'll take an afternoon and I'll go and take some steel wool and hot water, maybe a little Murphy's oil soap and scrub it down and clean the handles up. And you can take the handles back to where they almost look like this. So, um, uh, Number 12, it's very light. There's white, so we can see how close it is to white. Now, look how close this is. So the value should be somewhat like this. The value should be somewhat like that. So let's take the white, a touch of a blue-green, but we don't want it too colorful. We want to keep it a little bit more on the blue side to take it way, way back there. Remember, cools recede and warms advance. That's too cool. So I threw some ochre into it. Feels a little better, a little bit more, a little bit more. Once I get where I think I, I got it, we're gonna kind of brush it in real quickly. I have to use a little bit of turp in the beginning. So the turp is what we would call your lean. Lean meaning uh, doesn't have a lot of oil in it. So on a piece like this, which is a, a piece of hardboard. I, I almost grabbed a canvas. I had them both sitting here and I went, eh, did canvas last week. Let's do hardboard today. I'm one of these uh, strange individuals that isn't in love with any one specific surface. I like all various surfaces for different characteristics, truthfully. And this is hardboard, which I actually use quite often. Um, I don't use it a lot of times um, on larger pieces that I'm shipping simply because of weight. So 
So there's our mountain. Maybe it's a little on the flat side. So I threw some a little more ochre into that same color. And we'll just bring it down add a little bit. So I hate for flat colors drive me insane. Uh, just because, well, not insane, but they drive me a little bit. Um, bananas. I don't know if bananas is right either. Uh, um, what does hardboard mean? Hardboard is a form of masonite. It's, I think it's an untempered masonite is really what it is. It's, it's got a, um, let me watch. That's hardboard. Very thin, see it? Okay, there's a little bit of a hillside in front of that, a little bit darker. So let's take a little umber, a little bit of blue and mix that kind of slightly darker hillside in front of it, maybe a little ochre back into it. Just take it kind of towards the greens. It's close, it's pretty close. Want it maybe a little bit darker. So maybe this time I'll throw a little sap into it and ochre and let's see what happens. Almost like it, <laughs> almost, almost doesn't count. What's there's a line like that almost count only counts in horseshoes and something else. Not in basketball. So we're just kind of pushing the paint around, getting this background laid in kind of thin there's a little bit of interruption here and there on the hillside itself. Sometimes I'll just take and pull a stroke here and there. Just And if I don't like it, I'll just take the color and wipe it out. Trust yourself. You know, I know I say that a lot, but, and I, I mean it. I mean, I'm, I, I say it a lot because I mean it, okay? In other words, I guess what I'm saying is if I say it, I mean it. <laughs> it's not, I'm not just saying it for the sake of uh, filling the, the time with banter. I don't do banter, man. That's a little bit of the warm side, but for right now it's staying. It's a little bit, gives me a little bit of color mixture. It's beautiful little kind of a yellow feel back in here that isn't, doesn't have a lot of, um, um, Hang on, I gotta mess this up a little bit. I have that edge a little too neat, a little neater than I wanted at least. Okay, don't like the flatness of that for some reason. Okay, that's that feels better. I don't want it to look too empty, because we don't want that looking like a sky. So you need some elements back there to kind of take it away from just a flat sky, okay? Good enough. Let's kind of figure this. Yeah, there's a little green area. It's a vineyard, believe it or not. Uh, I know because I know where this is. It's here in Sonoma County, which has a tremendous amount of variety. Uh, and I know I've painted the coast um, for you here. And I've painted vineyards. And now we're painting a little farmland. Farmland generally is for vineyards, so it's nothing uh, really too crazy there. A little bit of green back here. I can bring a little bit of that. I can lighten it up. I, I actually lightened it just a little too much. Ray said that you have the best useful banter of any painter I know. <laughs> oh, thanks, Ray. Useful banter, I guess. Is there such a thing? It's kind of like, or is that an anomaly like jumbo shrimp? There's a wonderful uh, routine that George Carlin did once upon a time, things you never hear, like jumbo shrimp and uh, Joe's First National Bank and Hand me that piano, which is one of my favorites. But you don't hear people say that. Okay. Oh, 
Well, I've got that color, which is kind of a nice mixture. It's kind of a green and a little bit of, of raw sienna. Raw sienna warmth takes the green out of that acidy characteristic. Oh, and I kind of like that. It gives some activity. I need it. Really needs it. It's a little too flat. I don't want to spend time because this is a background and I can probably let a lot of stuff go. Okay. Let's, same brush, yellow. I have a yellow Hansa here. I'm going to mix some ochre into it and a little white. Ochre mellows it so it doesn't get too acidy. Let's see what it looks like. It's a little too strong. So let's bring some more ochre back. And maybe a little yellow and maybe a touch of umber just to kind of deepen it a little bit. Let's try it one more time. Big difference. So I'm going to add just a touch of medium to it because I got to paint over this paint and it looks like it's I can start right up about in here and mix it kind of into that green and then bring it down. If I need to brighten it, it's a nice, it'd be a wonderful little color accent I can use later on. And we'll put it over here. Looks like it's about all right about there. It's almost the same value as the uh, the board. A lot of these, a lot of these boards, whether they be uh, canvases or whether they be a um, uh, hardboard, I I toned a long time ago. I mean, I don't. Every now and then, in the you know when I'm cleaning up, I'll decide to uh, take a bunch of my spare boards, gesso them, and add a little tone to it. And um, so I never know, but I always keep them kind of neutral, uh, never too strong. Every now and then I get a wild inkling to want to do something a little crazy and I'll make one a little bit more on the red side, G generally more on the reds than I do the cools. Not really sure why. Just, you know, you begin to fall into certain uh, habits, sometimes good, sometimes bad, just like colors. Um, sometimes I'll use a color that I haven't used for a while and rediscover it and go, wow, I have, why haven't I used that for, even though I do stay pretty true to the kind of palette that I like, which is what I call my workhorse palette. Uh, we're gonna leave it at that so we can start to move forward a little bit. Okay, keep coming forward. It's a little tree hole in there. So let's kind of at least put a placement of where that yellow might be, maybe back in here. All right, I'm going to take this tree. Uh, no, I'm going to do the building first. I think I'm going to get this big mass in since it's so large. So for that, I'm going to use green. Mix it in the color I was just using, and I'm going to mix some burnt umber into it to kind of gray it down, maybe a little ultramarine. Not bad, not bad. I shock myself. Notice how I compliment myself when I uh, do do something really good. I'm not saying that's really good, but I do tend to, uh, at half the time I do it because it surprises me. Okay. Oh, look at that cool edge. Wow. Couldn't have done better if I had tried and I wasn't kind of trying. This is just a matter of brush. It has, it's got to have obviously the right color, the right value, but then it's load of paint, wetness of paint, and touch on the brush. I don't like that. I like that better. So Lorella has an interesting question. Do you think you can get fairly masterful if you're an artist that works in several mediums? I hope so. I, I work in several mediums. I hope so. Uh, oil, I came to oils, I wish I came late, but as a finished medium, I mean, I took some oil classes when I was in school, but I really didn't start doing any, what, what one might consider finished oil work until I was in kind of mid illustration career. And I felt like I could try it because most of my uh, illustration career was in acrylics. And I feel, it sounds kind of dumb, but I almost feel more comfortable in acrylics. Uh, it dries very quick. Uh, and I love pastel, but I mainly use it as a quick sketch medium. I really, uh, 
and not what anyone might consider a finished pastel artist. Uh, William Mon, one of our instructors at, at the academy who is a, the graduate head of the, in the illustration area is just a superb pastel artist. Albert Handel, another superb pastel artist. So there's a lot of guys out there. I, Skip Whitcomb, the guy that I went to art center with is one of the top pastel people. So there's, there's great people in all mediums and I enjoy all mediums. And I, the only reason I don't delve into them as much is I have been trying to build a, a gallery following and I'm trying, I try not to uh, confuse the viewers with too many different mediums. Interesting edges, huh? Should talk a little bit more about the edges because that's really one of the most crucial things in more in landscape painting than in any other form of painting. Um, it is in all forms, but landscape especially. Because there's so many different, you're trying to sometimes create clouds, right? Oh, it's a different characteristic in an edge than a tree. And a pine tree's got a different edge than a cypress tree or a eucalyptus tree. Uh, so you got all these different, and then a rock, then you get into rocks, and then you get into cliffs, right? And you, and you can keep going, get into pastures, fields, weeds, beat up trees, bare trees. So that's why, that's why in many respects, landscape is, 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 has a lot of challenges. Um, you have to enjoy the challenge. So the medium is very personal. Uh, it's, it's what you feel the most comfortable with. It's not, there's not a right or a wrong to any medium. Watercolor, love watercolor. Um, I don't do much of it, but whenever I do it, I rediscover how much I really enjoy it. So that'll be the same with all of you guys. You know, don't be afraid, but stay with the medium long enough to become good with it. That's, I would, I, if I were to give any advice of, regarding various mediums, that's what I would say. Don't work in pastel one day and then, well, well you know, I think I'm going to do an oil. No, I think I'll do an acrylic. Nah, I'm going to do some water. Maybe I'll just do, now charcoal is a different thing because that's drawing. You can never do enough drawing, ever, ever. And when I was a young youngster, I know, and I was a youngster once. Uh, when I was a youngster, I don't know why I say youngster, I sound like a really old. Uh, but when I was a young, young guy, I, um, before I had any training, okay, let's, let's use that as opposed to young, young guy. Before I had any training in terms of, of creating pictures, paintings, anything, I, uh, I worked in two mediums primarily, and that was charcoal. I worked did a lot of charcoal. I did a lot of markers with uh, they did markers of on sweatshirts made. You know, people still every now and then someone will remind me by holding up an old sweatshirt. It's kind of embarrassing that I did where I did a drawing of the Beatles and I did a nice Paul McCartney rendering. Um, and that was all charcoal, or that excuse me, that was all. Uh, marker, but that grew out of charcoal, which I, and after that, I got into doing, I always tell the story uh, that when I, when I was a, oh, it's, what was that, a junior in high school when I was about 16, because I just started driving, uh, I uh, did a pastel portrait of a girlfriend at the time, her sister was graduating high school and her parents asked me if I could do, I don't know, Barbara could even be listening. Uh, and it was the first pastel portrait I ever did. And I went, I did okay on it, you know? It's like, hey, I can do this. So started doing pastel portraits. Um, did them 
15 bucks a pop is what I was getting. And it was more than I could make in a grocery store or doing anything else. So basically that was my livelihood or that's the way I, it was my livelihood. My parents were my livelihood. Uh, it was a way I earned money when I was uh, for myself when I was about 16. I paid for my car insurance that way and gas, dates, things of that nature. So I started, I went to art school and immediately within the first week of art school, we had a paint and gouache. And so I painted in gouache for a couple of years. Did okay, it was a, it was a struggle. Um, never did what I would call really good. Finally, I think when I was a senior, maybe I started really getting the hang of it. Um, putting a tree back in here that I didn't see earlier, by the way. Uh, so anyway, I painted gouache and then from gouache to watercolor, from watercolor to acrylics, stayed in acrylics for a long time. Um, and from acrylics, I started messing. I, I took a head painting class three times. Man, I'm giving you history. This may be really boring to some of you guys. Uh, I'm reminiscing, so to speak. Um, I took a head painting class and in that head painting class, uh, I took it with a guy named Reynold Brown, who's quite famous now. That's what Ray was asking if your first opaque painting medium was gouache in Reynold Brown's class. Yes, it was. It was gouache in Reynold Brown's class. Actually, I took a class before that with a guy named Harvey Thompson. Uh, we did gouache too, but that was, I, that was so early on. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Uh, so anyway, to make a long story short, I think I made those, I think I took a, it made a short story long. Uh, but to make a long story short, pretty much, I fought it. It was, it was murder. I just couldn't get it. So I, and I took the class three times. Each time I did better. And at the end of the third time, I was gonna be a senior and Reynold Brown came up to me and said, would you like to try oil? I said, yeah, he says, well, I, I don't let people go into oil. I was the only guy in class that he let go into oil. I felt really privileged. And so I began to learn a little bit about the feeling of oil paint and um, I don't know that I loved it because I, I got really used to all my other classes and painting in acrylics, which is really was the versatile medium at the time for most illustrators. And so I went, as I went embarked upon an illustration career, I uh, was really more of an acrylic painter. Uh, but gouache and acrylics are somewhat similar. It's that acrylics, once they're dry, you're not going to pick them up. And I never got to where I could paint a gouache large. So you can see how I'm being somewhat careful with the edges of the trees. The reason being probably not going to be able to go back on top of it again. Now, uh, on a studio piece, I might go back three or four times, etch, them, etch back into it, take some away, go back and forth and back and forth until I get the exact feeling that I might really want for that tree, okay? So now I have to make it up. Um, so I'm gonna put that back up here. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, I see what it was. I had it taped up here, but not very good. Hopefully that'll hold. If it doesn't, I'll hold it, okay. Um, so we're going to keep, just continue on. Mix some brown in there by accident, but I'll just push it around and it'll become part of the foliage. All right. Now I need to be a little bit more precise. So I'm going to go to, a, I think I have a number six here. Usually it would be an eight, but I'm going to, and I'm going to get some of the buildings in. Gail wants to know which medium do you think takes the most skill to learn? Truthfully, I know there's a lot of people that would argue with me and say watercolor. Um, I truly believe oil. Uh, it's because it, for me, I can only speak for myself. 
uh, because there are so many factors in oil. There's, a, there's the viscosity, the thickness of the paint, how thick you want it to be. There's a lot going on, don't get me wrong, watercolor is, to really become a master of watercolor, and there are a few out there um, that, that blow me away, they're so good. Um, but I, it's just personal. I don't, I think that, if, now I can e more easily answer what, I, what do you think is the easiest? Because in that regard, I would say acrylics. I just find acrylics to be the most versatile also. That's why I think it's a great commercial medium. Uh, but some of the nicest compliments that I've had myself is when I do an acrylic painting and somebody said, geez, I thought that was oil. You know, you, you feel pretty good then. You feel like, I, I think what happens is when you become a little bit more adept at several mediums, they, they uh, one of the things I've, I found in, I was watching, um, and I, I probably have mentioned this, I was watching Richard Schmidt, who I think is the, one of the premier landscape painters alive today. Uh, I was watching him paint on stage. He was painting a figure. And in watching him, I noticed that he was using watercolor brushes quite often. And he painted very much like the watercolors. In fact, I had a, there was a student sitting near me and we were talking and I went, oh my God, he's painting like a watercolorist. That wasn't a, that wasn't a, a derogatory comment. That was just noticing it. It kind of amazed me. And I, I automatically went, you know what? I got a feeling there, every one of these mediums that I'm, I'm still, we're still talking about that that was a wonderful question. Um, the, the mediums kind of, I'm not going to put the little car in. There's a little car in that thing. I don't like it. Uh, the, the mediums themselves um, kind of overlap to a degree. And you can learn a lot about how to handle your brush, a la this stuff, from watercolor. I was talking to a a really well-known, famous, famous artist. Uh, I, won't, I won't say who because I'm gonna. He mentioned to me, "Do you paint? Have you, do you paint watercolor?" And I said, "Occasionally." I, he said, "Do you like it?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "I can't paint watercolor to save my life." And I thought that this is hard to believe because, uh, as good as this specific artist was, I could not understand. You know. The master of multi-mediums, in my opinion, is Bert Silverman. Uh, he paints, he can, he can, whatever he touches tends to come out great. And to me, he's one of the top artists alive today. That's again, giving you opinion. I'm not giving, I don't state it as fact because you know, I would have six people argue with me and there's no arguing only because it's an opinion, but uh, he's just, he's wonderful. Whether he doesn't, he's not a landscape artist, primarily a figurative artist. Uh, I don't doubt that he could, could do a landscape and blow people away, uh, but his passion is for the figure and whether he's working in pastel, uh, I have it at watercolor, oil, whatever he's doing is masterful. So I'm finding all the little textural, tonal and textural, oh, that's way too dark, textural and tonal variations within this barn right now. All right. And then there's, you guys can see a nice dark, which I'll go back. This little six is a wonderful brush. It's got a beautiful edge to it. So I can get, I can go in and do things like this and create a nice 
It's better to do that than to draw a line. And we'll do it down here. And then we'll do it on the other side. And it has a little warmth through it, just a touch of alizarin into that color. Little bit of an edge over. These are a little, we're being a little more careful than other things. Might as well, while well, I got the brush loaded with that dark, let's get it in there. And I did just what I told you don't do, but it's because I don't have anything else painted. And there's a little shrub, tree ish shape. There's a lot of little tiny things going on in here. Okay, now we want to break this area up in front. Uh, it's got kind of a rusty, so I'm going to go reach over to my burnt sienna, which I actually have on the panel today. It's because I was doing a painting and I need a burnt sienna and I kept it on my palette. So I didn't have to lay out a brand new palette. We'll just kind of put this nice dark shape. It almost looks like a box cover. Oh, I see. There is a side to it right here and a little bit duller and darker back here and down here and as long as I got that color because what I did is I just added a little blue to, to it and but I can actually go back on the corner while I've got the color in my brush and add some of these dark snaps so I don't have to repeat myself and re reinvent that color right below it, right about there. I made it wider, but who cares, huh? Only person that would really notice is the guy that owns the barn. And he probably wouldn't come and buy this painting anyway. And I also very highly recommend you change things to make them more interesting. If you can do something to make it more interesting and leave a window out, add another one in, add a lighter area, a darker area, all that stuff. Now, how do you learn that? That's that's a great question. I'm glad I asked that. Uh, you learn it, practice. Practice, observation, looking at great art, all those things. Ah. Okay, I'm gonna, have to do, I'm gonna have to do something about that. We're losing it, but uh, it is coming out better. I'm gonna ask Anna to grab me a better piece of tape because this is not holding. I have a, I have a piece of, that might work. Let's see if that works better. Piece of duct tape, huh? Duct tape holds the world together. <laughs> Make a lot of that of it. Oh, that may do it. Okay. So you can see we've got things shaping up. We got a little window there. We got a little dark back in here. Let me see if I can find any other darks that I need to snap in here while I've got this. Yeah, I do. There's a dark here because there's some lights on top. There's a dark right here. Dark way down below. I'm not even sure. It looks like it's growth down here. Okay. Let's just kind of leave that alone for a second. Let's get the roof in, which is a rusted. So I'm going to start with ochre. I'm going to take a little bit of uh, any, any one of my reds, any one of your reds, add a little white to it because it's pretty light. It's also kind of grayish, but maybe I want it a little bit punchier. Uh, it's a little too there. That's better. I had a, a little too pure of a color for, for my taste. So I, I just basically add a little bit of blue back into it. And a little bit of, I gotta look at my time here and see how we're doing. Oh, I got about, I got about 50 minutes, 50. 
some of the stuff is going to go much faster. Uh, this, there's a lot more could be added back in there. I mean, I can see a lot more interest there. There, there's another ridge. Another ridge right here. So there's just a lot more going on. But I don't want to stand forever on it. Uh, take the ultimate blue, the white, gray it down. How do you gray down blue with an orange? In this case, I use I always use umber because umber is a very warm color. So I'm, this becomes a very gray blue white, which is the way I see these little shapes. All right, boxcar shapes. So we're just we're painting activity. Now, if I were on location. I, I'd be able to tell more exactly what these were. Not, not that it's important. Sometimes it's almost good not to know and to just indicate. And don't worry about whether you're painting a box because you're painting, to a degree, a little bit of abstraction. I'm going to try to zoom in if they can't okay. see here or I can. We're using a new camera today, by the way. Actually, same one we used last week, but. Um, and sound, hopefully. Hopefully the sound's good. You know, we're learning as we go. You think we'd learn by now, but too many other things going on. Okay, I don't want to dwell on that. Let's get the roof on this, get this little building in here so we can move into other areas. Now this is a grayer building, so a little bit more blue, a little bit more brown, so it's the same color darkened. And we're going to go here, here, there. Any, any other just that I want to move around, maybe down below here a little bit. Uh, so, okay. Mitchell saying he thinks it was Bert Silverman who said he likes to put in a surprise color somewhere to add interest, like a small, it could be. small I mean, splash of red when red is nowhere else in the painting. Uh, well, I'm going to block you for a second here, you guys, just because I, I need to be able to put this worth bright white. It's This is white and maples together. So we got the, the light on that. I really made it too bright. Uh, it really needed to be toned down a little bit, but for right now, it's, I'm going to leave it at that. Now, it, there's a little other, so it isn't too flat. And that's the color I'm pretty much going to use for this roof. Roof line right here. Um, what I was going to uh, say is I've learned from often ex students, uh, and I had, I was. When I first started teaching, I had Malcolm Lipke in a class, and uh, Skip is how we know him. But uh, and he made a he went out and became a big illustration superstar and eventually a painting superstar. And he told me one time uh, that he likes to work, and I, I know I've mentioned this before, with his limited palette, like four colors. Then at the very end, decide if he wants to punch any color and then he'll do that but it, he keeps things harmonized very much so because of the limited palette and I completely think that's a, a very smart way to go about it. I don't do it but I you know it's his it's his deal it, but it's a real nice touch limited palettes can be just gorgeous I experiment a lot uh, in some of my classes, and sometimes I'll, I'll give an assignment where I have people choose white and two colors. I know you should give recommendations on those colors, but um, the concept is really to push yourself into arenas and maybe discover something that you can use on your own, you know? Tree right there. So we're gonna get that tree as it comes up back to here. That's a pretty thick trunk. That's why you saw me use this number 12. Staying with the 12. 
and we're going to put the top of that tree. Now, where does the top of that tree sit? About here. So that's going to be the top. And you notice I'm painting different than when I paint architecture. I was much more clean and precise with the architectural characteristics. Now I, I want the freedom of the edges. And we're, the further away I get from, say, a focal point, the more I might be looser and more abstracted, for lack of a, a better term. And we're going to leave it. I have to show off the roof line of that building, which isn't, and it's because it's not, nothing wrong with the roof color, it's this color. It needs to be darkened just a little bit. So we're going to do that, soften that edge. We're going to bring it over here so it continues. Okay. And while I've got it, a little bit of separation right here. There's a little fence back there too. If I have time, I'm gonna get some of that little stuff in the background in. Okay, so we get, you're looking for the busyness, but you're not, you're not dwelling on it. You're getting the basis in there and then you're moving. And that's, that will keep a piece of people, how do you keep a piece from looking over work? That's to me, it's, that's what you do. You put it in there and don't dwell on it. If you dwell on it, you're going to overwork it. You're going to second guess yourself. You're going to think you're wrong. You're going to want to go back and fix it. And eventually it just becomes a mess. So if that ever happens, take a big brush, smear it, get rid of it. Go back to the stage before when it was actually looking okay. Now that takes some experience. What I've just said is is not as easy to do as I made it sound. Because eva the evaluation part of painting, and probably, I, I know I've talked about it, but I probably don't talk about it enough. The evaluation part of painting is one of the most important parts. Uh, you really need to give your time, self time to evaluate, make a decision, move on it. little tiny bits back behind and the, the, what I'm leaving are tree trunks. Okay, got that in there. Is there anything up in here? There's that background color again. Let's see if I'm close, all I need to be is close. Okay, again, don't dwell on it. I know there's a lot more I could do and I'm I get tempted, but it looks kind of, oh, kind of <laughs> this is a term I like to use. It looks kind of okay. All right. Which means it may not be exactly everything you want, but at this stage, don't worry about it. What happens, and I, I may or may not have stated this before, but what happens as you paint is sometimes you find you don't need to do more to a piece because what you have down works in conjunction with the whole painting. But as you're painting on that one area, very often you may second guess yourself and go, oh, that isn't quite right. I need to do this. I need to do that. All of a sudden what has happened is you've overworked the heck out of that piece. All right, so we're gonna start moving down. This is laid in enough. I still need to go back and do things but it's laid in enough where I feel comfortable about moving down. Go back to a gesso brush, okay? Why, look at what we're gonna cover. Why use a little brush? Why use a little brush? Turk green, ochre, little umber, little white, maybe some yellow. I'm looking at the color that I'm mixing. What I'm saying to you is, I'm looking at the color I'm mixing on my palette and saying to myself, is that it? Or do I need to, does it need to be green? Does it need to be more brown? Is it too brown? Is it, so this is my first guess. 
Okay, I'm gonna throw a little more ochre into that color and then we got it. It's a little greener. The ochre will mellow it a little bit more. All right, so. A lot of turp because I wanna cover this, this pretty quickly. I wanna Lynn, overlap that. Lynn wants to know if you decide right at the beginning what temperature you want to be more dominant. Uh, kind of, kind of. This is a muted painting. So nothing is strong, nothing is powering out of the painting. Now at the end, I may make a decision. I may want to bring some strength to it. I may want to lighten, back. I think I'm going to. I can, that's got a nice setup, but I think I can punch that more. Um, so yes, I, I make decisions as I work, but I have a, a concept, color concept generally in mind when I start. Uh, a lot of it has to do with what I'm painting and what it looks like and the, the mood that I might be trying to strike. I want these to be thin because I hopefully I'm going to be able to paint some cows over it. So if I keep it thin enough, it's dry enough, I might be able to do that successfully. I know I can do it. I just don't know if I can do it successfully. That's the key. Key isn't can you do it? You all can do anything you want. Can you do it successfully? Eh. Yes and no. Gotta fill it in a little darker. That looks pretty darn good. And then here too. Uh, Mitchell wants to know, he's tried <clears throat> various brands of gesso brushes and they seem to leave hairs behind on the canvas. Do you have? This is a this is from Blick. And I've tried various types too. This is the one I think works the best that I've found. And occasionally I will get a hair, but really not much. I had a young lady, uh, I, well, I do these large scale workshops occasionally, usually once a year, and I, where I give out supplies. And I, you know, I kind of figure that into the cost, but, uh, and the supplies include three gesso brushes, a small one like this, and two that are a little bit larger. And most people totally fall in love with them, particularly when you're working large. Okay, so we got a couple hills in front. They're a little bit darker. Let's get those in. How are we doing time-wise? Ah, we're okay. Got about, mm, about 40 minutes. That's what it looks like to me. So I may be able to get those cows in, hopefully. I like that wet in the wet. It's almost watercolory. Okay, so. I may have to put it in and then take a rag and wipe it. I'll explain to you why in a sec. It all has to do with me painting back on top. Pieces of grass, but I didn't like them. They went too dark, so I just smeared them right back into the paint. So what, what you do, what it's doing is it's giving a little bit of a, a a little flavor of, uh, yeah, no, that's just, that's really thin. It's really watery or you can see the drip. That's, that's how wet it is. The turf is just, so it's, that, that's gonna be hard to paint into. Something like that, just because it's so wet. So what you do is you take one of your rags and you do this, you know, you don't have to only paint with a brush. Interesting textures too. Whatever works, whatever works. And the more artists you watch work, I've learned a lot just from watching. 
watching other artists and what they do. And sometimes it's what they pick up to use. It's not always, uh, I was watching uh, Gil Dillinger paint, he paints with these sponge brushes. I haven't tried them, but why not? So this is thin. And the brushwork, sometimes this active brushwork works for you. You don't always have to paint detail because what we're trying to do, try to make this feel correct. But we also, I also want people to look past it. I don't want people to stop and go, whoa, isn't that a beautiful foreground? I want them to kind of notice it, but reach beyond it because that's where, I'll, that's where my information is now. I mixed up with ochre, green, and white, a lot lighter but some lighter colors. And there's a nice little passage, right? It's got a little, brought a little bit more yellow into it. Right here, beautiful little passage of a little bit of a different color. So we're gonna kind of just put my first stroke down. I didn't like it, I wanna lighten it. So I put, oh, that's better. Put some more uh, Naples yellow into it. That's, don't want that. Steve says he's been learning from you since the 70s. Excuse me? Steve said he's been learning from you since the 70s. Well, well that's what happens. You can get that old, man. Saying all that, all you just did is told, you let everybody know that, man, this guy painting is really pretty old. It's experience, it's not age. I know guys so much younger that are so much better than I was at their age. And I think some of that, I like to, I always like to find my excuses. I, I you know, I always said I want to write a book on excuses for illustrators. Uh, but one of the things is, I was an illustrator. I had to paint many different ways. There's really a good part to that. And then there's a bad part because you're not quite discovering who you are. At least that's the way that I approach illustration. Probably not the most intelligent way, but it worked for me financially. Uh, and I learned about painting. I learned about creating pictures and a lot of different mediums and a lot of different styles. Then somewhere along the way, I had to decide what my style was. Sometimes. We lost. Yeah. Got it back? Yeah. This takes a second. <laughs> Every now and then, the, because of this new camera, sometimes it disappears on us and uh, we lose you guys. But we're coming back. We're not gonna. We're not gonna uh, abandon you. And by the way, just I might as well mention it. Uh, next Friday, uh, uh, my demonstration. We're still gonna do these alive painting, uh, but it's gonna come from in front of the Waterhouse Gallery in Santa Barbara. So if any of you guys are in the region and want to sneak down there at about noon, um, sit out in front, you're welcome to. And you can harass me, you can um, <laughs> do whatever. Distantly harass me. Yeah. And I, I do know people that have done that. And I don't mind it at all. Keeps me on my toes, guys, keeps me on my toes. I'm old and I need to be kept on my toes by you guys. Okay, I just stood back for the very first time. It's okay, I, got, I don't like this floating tree up here or this needs to be anchored a little bit more. Overall, you know, there are some good parts to it. Nothing is terrible, but there's some areas that I don't think are working as well. 
but I won't tell you what those are. I'll try to use my time wisely so I can go back and do some wonderful little touch up things that I would like to do little spots of light happening here and there. I lost my place. Oh, there we go. Little touches of little light, little brush. You know, as I'm not drawing, I've watched people do little line drawings in there and it really detracts. Splashes. Okay, let's see if we can get some cows in there. What do you say? I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna use this big kind of scrawny egg bird for the cows. All right. So here I tell you exactly what I'm gonna do, and then I do something different. Right? It's it's my prerogative. I just saw something. Is why. Kind of a ground plane up here. A little change of. Okay, you know, now let's do a cow. We want those dark. Blue, ultramarine, umber, ultramarine, umber. Goes one way, touch a white. Two blue, add more umber. If I want it one way, I want it a little bit on the warm side. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna do this guy right here. And he's right below this little house right here. So we're just going to put him, I'm going to keep him in the same spot. I like the spot. He's disappears there. And so Gail would like to know if you ever take an old painting that maybe you weren't happy with and rework it at a much later date. Yep. <laughs> Not a lot, but I have done it. In fact, I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, you can't see it, but there's a painting back there on that wall. Uh, a man in a German wine house. And I worked on it. I didn't like it. I abandoned it. Whoa, I turned him into an antelope. Uh, didn't want to do that, by the way. Just made a big, ugly stroke. So we just kind of take some of this color, turn it back into a cow. Uh, look, I'm playing God with animals. Is an antelope? No, it's a cow. Okay. That feels like a cow. Now, this, I kind of like some of these cows. Like, this is a cool cow. I'm going to put them, eh, this placement is pretty nice. One, two, three, way over here. Then some busyness. Then a couple of, there's a little, couple of little cows back, right? Looks like about there. I got to put a little light on their back. Another cow behind them. So this little shape in here could be defined a little bit more. So I got this nice blue and brown. All right, so let's put the dark part of this cow in right here. All right, so we're gonna put, there's his head. Go up. This, I can feel how wet this paint is as I paint into it. It's very, very wet. You know who does what I'm doing better than anybody? I like to give credit to great artists. And I'm going to give credit to one of the greatest right now, I think. And I don't know the man, and I wish I did because I'm a large fan. And the guy's name is Michael Workman. If you guys know Michael Workman, you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, you should. That's how you learn. You, you don't just learn, you learn by looking at their work. Look at their work and get into their head. Take a look at the way they've simplified. Just kind of popping these shapes in the way I see them. I will get rid of them if they're not working. I like this guy's facing this way. So I'm just spacing. I'm going to move them over a little further. I bring them over here as his head. 
neck. He's laying down in the grass. Okay, there's also, I added, I, I mixed this back into a little bit of green and white, same color, because there's some weeds right in here that I kind of like, right about here. Different characteristic. Painted the cow is completely different. I like that question about do I ever go back and rework? You know, generally I don't. The one painting I was talking to you about is a painting I just didn't finish because uh, I, I just it didn't feel right. Uh, and when I did go back and finish it, it was about uh, I would say three to four years later. Um, but generally speaking, I don't go back too often. I, if I do, it's just to do little touch-ups. It's like the question has arisen a few times about going back into plain air pieces. Um, I know a lot of artists that do. I don't. Uh, if I do, I literally go in for just a little bit. Um, I try and keep the integrity of the, the, the look of a plain air piece, which is hopefully a little looser and um, a little bolder at many, in many times than a finished painting might be. Now, this is where we, to avoid getting all these fingerprints that I'm getting, what I would often do, this is where you might use a mall stick, some sort of device so you can rest your hand and be a little bit controlling. So you put a little light on this guy. And this is an off-white that I mixed up. It's not a pure white. In fact, I'm gonna go a little darker. And I'm looking at my reference truck because I it's showing me a little bit of the structure of the cow itself. Back on its haunches, a little bit of light is look like I said, it's ambient light, it's top light. And so we've got a cow. All right, now we've got another cow, a little bit brighter. And I laid the shadows in, but let's get his head in. Well, got a lot of medium in the paint. Oh, that went a little too bright on me, but I'm just gonna move it back, manipulate it back into the color, and bring it down on the side of the cow and a little bit back on the haunches. And we'll push that almost like a sheep, doesn't it? Uh, not that it matters. A little bit brighter on the top. That's really bright. It's, I think that I think I went too far with that light. So I just mix some brown back into it. Little earth tone back into it. We'll have it. There we go. Okay. The one laying down, there's a cow in front of the one laying down. Right here. And this is a this little thing that I did here is a really good example of why you don't want to go too light too fast. It pops out of the picture. It's not, it's not that it's that difficult to correct. Nothing really is. You just have to be bold enough. I'm going to put a little bit of light on this cow. Just because I think he needs it. And the others can stay maybe a little bit on here. And a little bit of a dark. Don't like that spot right there. I don't know what the heck I was thinking. So let's just take my uh, gesso brush and kind of add some. It was too much of just a spot sitting there. I want some activity. I don't want it all chopped up like that. It's, it, it's, I'd rather just have, give a flow, give them a movement, so to speak, to this, this area. 
Michael has a good question. I'm wondering about perspective. The size of the cows in the photo make the barn in the background seem to be really huge. I'm wondering if the camera lens has flattened perspective. No, I don't think so. Uh, uh, it does, you know, a, a camera lens will. Uh, I don't think here necessarily it, it has. Uh, I just think it's a big barn. You know, barns can be all different kinds of sizes. There's not a um, an exact kind of a barn. That feels better right there. Don't like the darkness of that guy for some reason. Um, I think what I need to do is lose him a little bit in the shadows. Okay, so we got a layer. Now let's go back and start to fix things, okay? Number one, I told you I didn't like that tree. So let's fix that tree. So we're gonna take the value and the color, which I've got a lot of greens up here. I'm just kind of messing, there we go. That's, that to me is a little too green. So I'm throwing just a hint of a warm color into it. Bring it back down on, it's still, still too green. That's better back down on the mountain, right about in here. You can see it get a little darker. So I'm embellishing this hillside just a touch, maybe here too, maybe I didn't push it enough. Twice, I revisit areas. I use that term a lot where I will revisit an area that I laid in. I might've thought it looked good at the time. And upon, you know, reevaluating it at a later, as the whole painting starts to take more shape, I might decide that I need a little bit more of one thing or another, darker, a little more color, softer, all those things are possibilities. Just don't be afraid to augment what you've done in the beginning. If you need to do it, do it. So we got the tree. Now, that tree here might work if I get some other tones up in here. I just kind of want these to be abstract feeling, feelings of different kinds of textures back in that plane. Okay, there's a couple of things going on. Uh, number one, I mentioned earlier, and this is where I'll probably use more of my egg bird. Uh, I'm going to take and I'm going to brighten up I'm doing this not because it, that's the way it appears, but I'm going to brighten this area up right here. Probably blocking you with my ball stick. Just a little bit. So you can see it just a little bit more. It just takes that flat area and gives it a little bit of life. As this tone moves over to here, it gets lighter. So why not use this time to lighten and brighten that area up a little bit. Now, it's a duller tone. I've, I've enhanced the, the intensity of that color. And I may not like it, but it's my first thought of what I think will work. That's literally what you're doing. I've stepped back for a second. My first thought, does it bother me? Answer, no, it might bother you. You might step back and look at it and go, oh, I don't like that. Be careful about doing that too many times. Trust yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna grab this little liner. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw some fence posts in because that's gonna give some scale to things. First place, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna set the small stick here so I don't rest my hand. It's right about here. There. Oh, that's a good color. It's just a, a gray brown, has a little bit of white in it, so it isn't too dark. And if there's six or seven and you make eight, big deal. No one's counting. Over here, I've seen another, these are areas you want to look at. I don't want to rest that, screw that up. But right, let me rest it here. Right here. 
one. Okay, where else? Kind of, kind of parouse the whole thing back behind it. A little bit darker, right here. Okay, so you start to give, if everything, all this kind of stuff gives scale, by the way. It's not just, um, it, somebody was asking about the, the cows. Well, it's a, this is a big barn. I mean, there's no question. I can tell by looking at this, it's quite large. Um, so now I will go in and I will say, okay, I don't like that edge. I'm gonna clean that edge up. But I also notice on the very top of this particular roof in here, I'm getting a lighter color. So I'm going to go with more of a white, and it's kind of a dull white. So I have a, I happen to have a um, unbleached titanium. So we're going to take that, and we're going to put in too heavy-handed right there. I tell you right now, it worked. It is a little heavy-handed. Back to the back to the whiter version of that. A little medium. Get a nice tip on your brush because we want to put a little bit of this light right here. Okay, so it helps finish that off. Now there's a little, I don't, I don't like that light area there, but I do like some of the stuff that's going on. There, there's a fence, wow, way, way, way. I just saw this. Now if you're on location, you're gonna see this much clearer. Um, this is basically learning how to look back into your photographs, but there is a fence right here, believe it or not. And I'm gonna put this little post in because I like the linear aspect of it right here. It's right there. And I'm gonna clean up the roof line here because I, I really slopped that in when I did it. I wasn't very clean about it. So we're gonna take a little bit more white and a little bit of the blue. So remember it's a grayer roof line. A little bit of the earth tone. And Give it a better angle. So it comes more that way. I made the roof come out too far, but I kind of like that. It almost looks like that's the way it should be. Um, start to add a little bit of tops, a little bit lighter here. Well, I've got the lighter color. Now, let's go back into the barn because I did that. That's our focal point. This side, this side of the barn has got a little bit, I'm not sure why, could be cloud cover, could be anything, but it's a little lighter than this side. So I mixed up a color with a little more white in it. And what I will do with a liner, it's kind of a gray white with a little bit of blue mixed back in. So I like that. It gives it, it, it helps the volume part of it. All right, now on the front, the face of that building, we have opportunity. Thankfully, I didn't pick something with a ton of detail down in here. So it allows me to be able to go back into areas like this and add a little bit more life to it. In this case, whites, but they're not, they're not as white as this. So you don't see me use, sit down and use a little brush like this that much, but I do. It's because I never get far enough on a piece 
in this case, it got far enough where I could actually go in and begin to make my focal point a little bit more uh, pronounced. Now, put it in and step back, okay? To me, it's starting to work. Everything is beginning to shape up. I see some little lights. I don't know what those are. I do see a little light on that tree trunk as it fades down into, um, into the shadow area, right about in here. And we hit that. A couple of little of other lighter kind of bluish spots right in here. There. There's this road. Looks like it's a road. I'm going to make it a road. Um, I could do this with a lot of different things, but I'm going to use this brush. And I'm going to make that more pronounced than it was. Looks like there's a little plateau here that leads into that area there. And I'm constantly standing back. Uh, now, I, I, as I stood back this last time, I looked at the cows. It bothered me a little bit because some of them stand out too much. I probably went too dark. So let's see what happens if I just mix a grayer color. That feels a lot better. I don't even know if you guys can see the difference, but boy, I can. They're very harsh. All I did is I took the same color and just mixed a little bit of white back into it. That's all. Always take the green background, fix it. Got a spot here. Now, another area about this white here bothers me a little bit because it feels too strong. So I'm just trying to find a color with green and the earth tone. Earth tone meaning umber. Eventually, I will hit upon something that begins to work. Take more ochre into that color. This is what I would play with a lot towards the end. Color variation. See, I think I blew it on that tree trunk because I think that tree trunk could come down further. So let's bring it down. It's not that hard to mix that color up again. So let's take it and bring it down a little bit lower, down almost to the road. Let's do a little bit in the bottom of these trees. So I get a little bit of light as I look, filtering back through. So that's this is the kind of stuff at the very end, man. If you have the time to go in and be able to manipulate and play with these things, this is where you take a painting from being uh, a study, even a plain air painting, uh, a study into being a little bit more of a or a fine painting. And there's good parts in both. You know, there's there's parts of studies that. Uh, artists happen to really gravitate towards particularly because they, they really see more of the artist's hand in it and not so much of the ref, you know super refinement that there might be in a piece, but they see more of a, um, the artist's reaction to, to the subject. So we're gonna add a little bit of demand, oh God, I didn't realize I picked up color that white. 
I want to go back and add into this area right in here. That's still too too light. And that's my problem. I just didn't clean my brush enough. I still had too much light from the brush back into that color. So let's go there. A little bit in here. We're gonna we're gonna lose that because that's I, I made that too strong. But if I work with it enough down into this color, it will, there we go. We're giving the layers. So it isn't too vacant. Now, if I see anything in here, I begin to see a little bit right now. If I look very carefully, I can see a little bit of a modulation. Uh, and I, I use that word sparing a little bit. It, it just takes these trees from being a flat shape into giving them just a taste of, of space and dimension. You can do the same in here. We can look and say, I see a little bit of modulation right in here. Sneak up on it. Don't go too far. Put it in real subtle, much more subtle than you might think. Then at the end, if you want to push it a little further, try to push it a little further. You push it, finally push it too far, pull back on it. That's starting where I, this line is so powerful right now. It's bothering me. I want to, I want it to dissipate as it goes across the page. So let's try. I bring some turp into that. I'm looking at the painting, not my reference now. Okay, very important. The painting is what the viewers see. They do not see your reference. They do not see what you saw. So the painting has got to look good. It doesn't just have to replicate the reference. Okay, that feels better. It's not going all the way across. It still bothers me that that line is so prominent. I think I need to lose it a little bit here and there. Now it's not as much of a line. It's starting, it, it's beginning to feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, yeah, and these are these judgment calls that you're all going to be making as you move throughout your painting. So you start, you say, okay, everything's working, everything's working. Uh, you get it to this point and it's, it's shaped up. This bothers me, it's a little too flat, but you, remember one thing, when I put that in there, I mixed a little white into it. So I go back, I'm going to go back with the brown and the blue and the green together. And I have a little residue in my paintbrush, meaning a little bit of other colors still there. And I'm just going to try something. Nope. Yeah, that's good. Because I'm darker. Tree trunks. And basically what I'm doing is just painting some of the what we would call the deeper shadows into this part of the tree. Tree trunk, tree trunk. That's why I do not like to go all the way to, to the maximum right out the bat. It, it gives, I have room now to deepen the shadows. If I just started with these super deep shadows, I have no room to deepen the shadows. I only have to, now I can go both ways. I can bring out some lights and I can push some of the shadows a little, a little bit more. I'm not even gonna look at the reference. It fell on purpose. I <laughs> would like to say I did that because I didn't wanna be a, a prisoner to exactly what I saw. 
So I don't even know if this is showing up. It is here. It's, it's very subtle. Oh, I like that. I like that kind of soft. I mean, sometimes it's nice just to pull an edge. Take one, I'm going to take one quick step back because we're just about done. Got a couple minutes. All right, I'm going to do one or two things based on the painting because, again, I don't want to necessarily look at the reference. Especially since you can. Huh? Especially since you can't because it fell. I can. I just don't want to look at it. <laughs> Because I want to look. At, I want to see if the painting looks good. And, and very often we get hung up with trying to replicate our reference exactly. When we do, we lose. Sometimes there are things that occur in a in a an image that is not conducive to a painting because the the viewer misreads it, and it can be detrimental to the design. It can be detrimental to um, the color scheme. You see a color that comes out really strong. Now I can judge the color scheme. You know, I mean, I think if I did anything, probably that color scheme, I might take this field and like a little darker over here before it gets over into that light. So it's lighter back here. I might want to punch. That area just a little bit so we get that kind of the layering of distant forms i can see right here i could probably make these things feel a little more geometric and we're about out of time so i'm not gonna dwell but i did want to show my whole concept today for you guys was to do something that was lit flat that did not have, last week I had a really, really super strong light and shadow. And so what I did is I saved those brighter lights to the end. In this case, there are no real bright, bright lights. There, there are areas um, that are stronger than other areas, but the, the relationship of light and shadow is pretty much ambient light straight down. In other words, we're not seeing the clarification. I see one thing I did here. I wiped this post out. So let's bring it up a little higher. It's a little light on the side of it. I don't necessarily think I need it because it's not important. It's not where the focal point is. This is the focal point. If I want to right now, I can a little bit deeper, just a little bit darker. A little bit darker here. A little bit on the edge. And I think we're about, we're going to call it done, whether it's done or not. I could see I could play a lot more with some uh, tonal variations up on that mountain. Uh, I, I kind of don't want to right now. I'm trying, there we go, some warms. Sneak some warms up in here, but not where they're too pronounced. And you can build that forever until it, it begins to feel right. Uh, it feels okay now. I mean, it's not bad. If I were, if this is a plain air piece, I'd say, okay, I'm fine. Uh, if it were a studio piece, I would probably develop this, but I wanna keep it as free and abstracted as I possibly can. I do not want that to get over overworked, so to speak. So I'll use my big brush, sweep, move, maybe, now I've got a little bit more violets coming into it. Feels pretty good. I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to do much more to it. I am going to just um, tell you all that, uh, I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> uh, next week, we're going to be doing the same thing. Uh, I'm going to be doing it out in front of the Waterhouse Gallery, uh, probably from some sort of Santa Barbara reference. And uh, if anybody's in the area, please come by, say hello. Otherwise, Happy painting, everybody, and um, don't know what else to say. Hopefully, this gave you some information that you hasn't, haven't gotten in the past, okay?
Bye.